I wonder if you know this song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Why are you singing? I know why, because you don't know who to put in the bit in towards the end of the song. It's the church. It's Pentecost Sunday today. Church's birthday, so come on. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear church. Happy birthday to you. Great. I don't know who we're going to give the bumps to, but do you know, I, I, um, we, have a bit of a, we have a bit of a tradition in our home that when it comes to birthdays, and anniversaries that there are a number of things that we do fairly regularly during that time and one of them is we look at some old photographs when I was um, when I was in my office at home this morning praying uh, there was a lovely photograph uh, just in front of me on my computer that um, is of the day that Nita and I got engaged You might be okay, because it didn't work in the first service. Uh, she hasn't changed a bit. As beautiful today as she always was. I was 18 years of age there. That's what Mark looks like with hair and with a few less calories. Amazing, I wasn't even shaving. And I got in, I wasn't even shaving probably on my wedding day to be honest, but uh, it's amazing. And then um, we, we often do the same with our, with our kids on birthdays. And they're away at youth camp uh, this week. So as long as you don't tell them, I might get away with this. Um, but it's not a birth picture. This is of them from a few years ago. I think particularly my daughter might um, have a word with me about showing that later on. So that's Joel, Luke, and, and Chloe Grace. And, uh, and we love doing that. We love looking back at those pictures because it just reminds us of what has been. And um, some of you don't realize this. We've, uh, we've done some homework. We've been into some of your um, personal photograph collections. And there's one person here this morning that we're going to show a, a really embarrassing photograph of you when you were a child. No, we're not. Don't worry. Is he okay? You're okay. But anniversaries, birthday celebrations, the, the birthday of the church, it would be appropriate for us to go and take a snapshot back to when it all started. But of course, birthdays and anniversaries are not just moments that we remember something that has happened, but we celebrate something that has happened in all those intervening years, and we celebrate what is yet to come. That's the important thing about a birthday. It isn't just about the moment you were born. It's about everything that follows that as well. And we're going to look today at that birthplace of the church. A few thousand years ago, where Jesus made a promise just prior to it. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against the church that Jesus will build. That was a promise that he made. And then, of course, it seemed scuppered because he then went and died. But then he rose again and he appeared to lots of people. Some people think that it must have just been an apparition of some form that people wanted to see Jesus so badly. They just imagined him as a figment of their imagination. But lots of people imagined having breakfast with this person, if that's the case. Like a group apparition is just you know, fairly impossible to achieve. And so Jesus appeared to many people, convincing them that he was alive and well. But I want to take us back to a time that was hundreds of years prior to that, where something was foretold about the birth of the church. And this is found in an Old Testament book in Joel chapter 2. And it says this, Joel 2, 26 to 29. And afterwards... 28 to 29, and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. That was foretelling of the birth of the church. In fact, we know that because on the day of Pentecost, 
Peter, one of the disciples, the apostles, he stood up in front of thousands of people and he said, you may wonder what all this commotion is about, but this is what jo Joel, many hundreds of years previously, said. And this is the fulfillment of that. This is the Spirit of God being poured out on all people from all cultures. So that's prior foretelling or prophesying of something that was to come. And I want us to now look at Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at the time when Jesus does the handover. And it says this, Acts 1, 3 to 9, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. We then read, we go on to the next steps of the disciples. We look forward a few verses to verse 12, and it says this, Then the apostles, those same people who had just seen Jesus go to heaven, it says the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. It's a fascinating, um, it, it says that the distance between where they were seeing Jesus ascend at heaven and this room, uh, which is called the upper room, that the distance was just a Sabbath day's walk. Now, uh, according to Jewish tradition uh, and law, that a Sabbath walk could be no more than really a kilometer. So it was fairly close. You know, I, I think we live in a world where some people almost think that the further you travel, the more anointing you get when you go to a conference. You know, it seems like if you get on a plane and you make your way to the States, then somehow God clocks up anointing miles like air miles. And that you're going to definitely hear from God if that happens. But I find that sometimes the steps between where you are and where God wants to bless you is often not a very long journey. That there's often just a few steps of obedience you need to take to take you to the place where God wants you. And they could have been so close and yet so far. They could have been hanging out just in the wrong place. They could have built a monument. This is the place that Jesus ascended into heaven. This is holy ground. Let's make a statue here. Let's make an altar here. Let's hang around this place. But of course, Jesus' instruction wasn't to stay at that place, but it was to go to Jerusalem. And so their steps are simple as they seemed were steps of obedience and sometimes the things that Jesus asks us to do are so simple that we miss them you know when I think of the prophet saying to Naaman I want you to go and you covered in leprosy and he said what can I do to be healed and I think if they'd said we want you to sell all your fortune and give it a charity then he may have found that easier but he just asked him to go and dip himself in the river Jordan seven times and it was almost like this is too simple this is just silly. And so they take the short journey to Jerusalem and they head to the upper room. Now, there's a good chance that this upper room was the same upper room that Jesus had met with the disciples just a number of weeks previously. And it was likely to be the same place where he had sat down with them and shared the Lord's Supper before his crucifixion. You know, the scene where he said, the person who dips their bread, same time as me, is the person who betrayed me. And so Jesus 
was once in that room and not in the room now. Judas, it says there's a Judas there, but it's not the same Judas. There were two Judas disciples that Judas betrayed Jesus, that his seat was vacant where he once sat also. And I, and I find that the way my mind works, that I can get stuck in those moments of reminiscing. To go into that room and think, oh, you remember the last time we were here, guys? Does anybody ever get those sentimental moments? Remember when we were in the room last? Jesus was sitting there. Oh, weren't they good times? And Judas, the dog. Judas, how could he do that? How could he be with us all these years and yet do that? How could he betray our Savior like that? And they could have got stuck there. They could have got stuck in the issues of their past. But they hadn't made that journey to a familiar place to get stuck in familiar issues of the past. They had made their journey to that place because there was something new they were about to step into. And what they were about to step into required them to step away from those issues of the past. And I often find that in our lives, we have a tendency to get stuck. Stuck with the trauma, stuck with the pain, stuck with the grief. Now those things are real, I'm not denying them. Jesus was definitely betrayed by Judas. Jesus definitely wasn't with them, present in the room, like he once was. But you see, they could have got stuck. You and I can get stuck in those places. And they didn't. We read on chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. It says, when the day of Pentecost came. By the way, there was a, a Jewish celebration that had been inaugurated in the Old Testament that was that took place seven weeks after Passover. And when you do the calculations that the day of Pentecost probably came on the day of that festival. And the timing of God is incredible. The way that he is so ordered. He doesn't do anything by accident, you know. He he understands the detail of our lives and understands the detail of the world around us. It says when the day of Pentecost came They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Meds, Alamats, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea. I've gone beyond the scriptures here, and I did that because I couldn't pronounce the names. Go back to the first verse of that chapter. It says that they were all together in one place. We're in our One Another series. And I find it fascinating that the birth of the church set a paradigm and a principle that to be a people of God, empowered by the Spirit, that the people were all together in one place. When it says all together, it wasn't just a physical all together. They were obviously geographically crowded into this room. I don't quite know how they fit everybody in. There were about 120 people gathered at this point. It says they were praying constantly. And when I think of that scene and I think of that moment and that occasion, I realize that it wasn't just a physical gathered moment, but there was a togetherness that went beyond the physical. See, they had made a decision to be there. Uh, This was not something that they had drifted into. This wasn't something that they emotionally felt was convenient for their lives. This was not something that they went to because they heard that the house had been uh, kitted out with wonderful facilities and they were intrigued to see. And when I, I see some parody films put together these days of, uh, you know that, um, you know that TV program that uh, is 
people looking for a house to buy and they get toured around different houses. Have you seen the parody of looking for a new church? Have you seen that one where there's a couple and they're being shown around different churches and they're interviewed afterwards and they said, well, you know, the pastor was um, probably a little bit old fashioned for us. You know, we found his style a little bit inaccessible. And then another place they go, well, you know, the car parking wasn't suitable. And, you know, it didn't meet our needs. And the other one says, oh, the coffee was great. You know, the coffee really, you know, ticked the boxes for us. And the kids' work seems good. And it's a parody uh, that's really sad because it paints a very different picture to the early church. Because this is not meant to be a gathering because we've got good facilities and we put on good services and because we have good activities and good programs. This is meant to be a place where because of our absolute devotion and love to Jesus that we have made a decision to gather together as the people of God because we understand that we're a part of a historic movement where Jesus said, I will build my church and you and I are invited to be a part of that journey. That's why we're gathered. And if, if someone says, oh, I, you know, the, the seats are a little bit uncomfortable or, you know, why don't we get air conditioned? Because it's only warm two Sundays of the year. That's why. <laughs> and, you know, we want to we, we create a nice experience for people, but it's primarily not our growth strategy. The kingdom of God advances by people making decisions on other things other than convenience, other than preference. And they were all together because they had made an active decision to be obedient. They were there because Jesus told them to be there. No other reason. It was obedience, not convenience. But you know, something that's wonderful about obedience and something as bad about obedience, obedience can be abused in the world. Because if you create subservient cultures, someone can say, because they've got authority, you should do this. And then people feel out of fear that they need to respond and say, okay, I'll do that. But that's not the obedience Jesus calls for. The obedience Jesus calls for is one that says... I cannot believe how you have blessed me. I can't believe how amazing you are toward me. It is my joy to do whatever you say because I understand it is for my best. And that's the sort of obedience these disciples had because they knew what it was like to hang out with Jesus. They understood his character. They understood his ways. And obedience wasn't a burden. It was a joy. So they were more than physically connected. They were connected in spite of their differences. Think about the, the menagerie of people that were in this room. These were an eclectic bunch. Writing this book of Luke, a uh, book of Acts, is Luke, an articulate, educated doctor. Clever man. Written so beautifully written so skillfully but he's sitting in the room with Peter fisherman yeah. <laughs> who when Jesus is arrested in the garden of Gethsemane he takes out his sword and he cuts one of the guards ears off can you imagine Luke going oh Peter get an education but then in the middle of the room you've got Sibling rivalries, the sons of thunder, and the mum, egg of the morning. Now's your opportunity, Jesus gone, now you can be the leader. But then, you see, Israel was an occupied territory. The Romans had occupied the land, and so there were lots of people who resented that, but a lot of people made decisions that they were going to um, find a way around that inconvenience and around that hostility by being as peaceable as they could with their community. And people who were in that category sometimes became tax collectors. There were some of those in the stories of Jesus. But then there were some that became terrorist groups that said, we are going to turn over these Roman oppressors. We're going to be the resistance. And Simon was one of those. 
And all of these people are in the room. And Jesus, who had been like the grace, just to keep it all together, he's not in the room. These guys could have been at each other's throats. There's a gap of leadership. Who's in charge now? James and John's mum going, come on, get forward. Come on, get in there, son, sons. And there could have been a gap and a vacancy. But we don't read that there's a fight that takes place. We read there's something beautiful that they are all together. Do you know the church? We should be so able to celebrate the eclectic nature of the people of God. We are multinational, multicultural, multi-background, multi-age, multi-generational. And we should be able to celebrate that. Why? Because... Jesus brings us all together. I believe there was a key reason why they were able to know that, a reality in their lives. These people were focused as well. They must have had questions about their careers. Some of them had laid down their fishing nets and got rid of their boats. They had wives and kids that they were still responsible to pay taxes for to still look after their welfare and their well-being and they're now sitting in a room in Jerusalem for 10 days praying if they'd had mobile phones in those days there would have been a few texts sent by the wives when are you coming home what are you up to When you eventually come home, will you bring milk, please? (laughs) We've just had another bill for the door. This one's red. When are you going to get a job? Do you know, it's so easy to read these stories and think, oh yeah, they were focused on Jesus, they were focused on Jesus. But they had lives like you and I. And there were lots of things that could have taken their attention and demanded their focus. But they decided... That they were going to be obedient. Jesus said, go in Jerusalem and wait there. Obedience costs. Obedience rarely fits into convenience. Obedience is always a joy, but it is a sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 22 says these words. Let us... Draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly. I love that picture. Didn't have cars in those days, but it works today. Let us hold unswervingly. Let's keep straight and focused to the hope that we profess For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, that means weigh up, that means intentionally come to a conclusion and some decisions. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Do you know it should be like when we come to church, you should be thinking, who can I spur on today? Who can I egg on? Come on. The person sitting next to you, they don't just feel welcomed, they feel spurred, stirred. Let us consider how we can spur one another on towards love. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's not give up meeting together. Not just meeting, but together. You see, our worship and our prayers can hit the ceiling of silence if we're not together. Not just physically, but united in heart. I believe that prayer allows us to be together. It causes the people of God to take their eyes off their differences and put them on the focus of the thing and the person and the wonder that unites us. I believe that prayer changes that. 
I believe that a praying church is a life-filled church. I believe the people of God that pray and enjoy the sense of meeting with God together, they don't get caught up in the trivialities. In church history, there have been many times when churches have struggled, where they've split, where they've fallen out, where they've had arguments, and you know we can't pretend those things haven't happened. But I, I don't really know a story of where that's happened, where the church has been together in prayer, united in heart and focus. There's always some other agenda grabs the hearts of people. They lose their focus because they lose their prayer. But when we unite together, I believe Jesus brings his presence in his Holy Spirit. But it says all together in one place. This, as I said, was a place where it could have been a reflection of grief, a place of betrayal, a place of disappointment, a place of dashed hopes. And they could have sat around looking at those empty seats and been reminded of those things. But that's not what they did. Because, you see, I believe that when we pray, that God takes away the temptation for us to pull out the microscope and replaces it with a telescope. You see, when you and I get disappointed, when you and I get injured in our lives, the tendency is to try to drill down to the detail and to stay there. We put the pain under the microscope and we want to understand it. I know many people who get lost in pain because they're trying to understand something. And there are times when those questions are unresolvable with our finite minds. And I know people, they're in a place of opportunity. They're in a place of promise. They're in a place where there's an abundance of what God is about to do and wanting to do in their life. But they're stuck at the place of pain. And I'm not minimizing that. I'm not minimizing the hurt. But I am saying that when you hang out with Jesus, he doesn't ignore it, but he gives you the ability to see further, to see beyond, to see in distant galaxies of what God's up to. And I believe that's what the disciples did here. They didn't get lost in therapy session of how they were going to deal with his disappointment. And there's nothing, I have no problem with therapy. I have no problem with counseling and understanding those things at all. I believe in it. I recommend it. I operate in it. And so I'm not speaking against those things. But there are times regularly when we obey God that he wants to give us a new vision for something that's further and bigger than your circumstance. We're caught in the insular nature of our immediate needs, of our immediate pain. And you see, I don't think that the enemy's strategy is just to make your life difficult. I think the enemy's strategy is to kill your dreams, is to take away your vision. I believe one of the things he wants to do on the church across the globe is to let us think that there is no future. Because when he does that, we live according to that. We live under the ceiling of that. And a praying church, I believe, gets his telescope out and sees what God is saying. Sees his promises afresh. And this birth of the church, they were focused not because they were trying to be disciplined in their thoughts. They were focused because they believed the vision that Jesus had given them. And the vision was this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. The people of God, all together in one place, I believe are poised for the greatest days on the planet. I can't say that just for some rationale but I say it from a place of a telescope, from a place of looking at the lens of what God's Word says. I believe that in these days when sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. 
In these days when fear seeks to keep people from their destiny and purpose, that God's love wants to break the back of that and wants to release people into their destiny and their purpose. I believe the best days are yet to come. I believe the best days for your life are yet to come. I believe that God has a purpose for your life. I believe he's got promises. He's spoken over you. Who this morning has got some promises that God has spoken over their life and they've not yet seen fulfilled? Just put your hand up. Would you, can I ask that you stand a moment? If you raise your hand there, there's some unfulfilled promises over your life. Because there are decisions, there are places that God will call you out of obedience. And some of them may be distant, but some of them will just be a short distance. And there's a walk of obedience. And some of you standing right now, your dreams, your hopes, your promises feel like they've been under attack. And you feel hopeless. Not sure if they can happen. Think back hundreds of years before this day of Pentecost moment. The birth of the church. This promise was given to a prophet. And then... He had no idea that when that would be fulfilled, but hundreds of years later, Peter stands up and says, this is that. I believe there's a day coming on your life when you will make sense and God will say, this is that spoken over you. This is that promise that I've spoken over your life. This is its fulfillment. This is my faithfulness revealing itself into your life. Can I just invite you to lift your hands, those who are standing, and just express afresh to God. I trust you, God. I trust you. I trust your word. I trust your promise over me. I trust your purposes over my life. I trust that you are faithful, that there's no lie that comes out of you. That when you speak, your words are true. And we claim these promises now. We, where we've been analyzing with a microscope our disappointments, we choose now to put that down and to, in obedience to pick up a telescope and to see into the things that God has for us, to see the purposes, to dream again, to see into destiny, to see into fulfillment and to claim it in the name of Jesus. And I speak in the name of Jesus over your life that there will be an understanding of faith rising in your heart because some of you have walked away from the promises of God because of disillusionment. And for you, the promises of God are a little bit like those automatic doors into the foyer of a hotel. They open as you approach them and your faithlessness because you've been so discouraged, you've been walking away from the doors and every time you glance around, you think they're still closed and God is saying, walk towards it in Jesus' name. Walk towards the promises in your life. Walk towards its fulfillment and its destiny and watch the Lord open the door. Holy Spirit, I pray that you pour yourself out now on these people. Fill afresh in the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of Jesus. Please feel free to take your seats just a moment. We're about to pray collectively. But let me read you Acts 2, verses 42. This shows us that Christianity is more than a hobby. It says this. The disciples, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They were still together, guys. They were still together. And they had everything in common. This is pretty revolutionary stuff. They sold property and possessions and gave to anybody who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved that's my prayer for this city daily there will be people discovering the love of God daily I thank God that nearly every week over the last 18 months we've seen people giving their lives to Jesus on a Sunday I thank God for that fruit. I thank God for what he's doing in so many of your lives. But I pray 
that you and I will have the joy of daily leading people to Jesus. That we will live our lives in awe and wonder of the works that God is doing. But we need to stop staring at the empty seats of disappointment and to step into obedience. Saying, here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. You know, as Femi's been taking us around a tour of the church ministries, I hope you've not understood those things as the only ministries we recognize within the church. Because where you work is a ministry. Where you live is a ministry. Where you study is a ministry. I was talking to a guy before the first service, just started a new job, connected with another Christian in his workplace who also comes to this church and he said we've just been prophesying over some of the staff in the staff room he said they don't know that's what we're doing and we're not giving them a Bible study on what prophecy is but we've been speaking some stuff over their life that God has been revealing to us you know most of the gifts of the spirit that we read about in the scriptures weren't operated in church they were operated in the world you know this isn't the place where God does all the business. This is the place where God empowers his people so when we go out into the world we live as the people of God and even though we may not be together in one place we're together in one heart and one purpose and one focus to see his kingdom come and his will be done. Let's pray together. I've spoken a lot about the disciples today and about their decisions. But the real star of this show, the real star of this story, is the Holy Spirit, who took a ragamuffin bunch of guys and made them world changers. That's what he does. He's been doing it for thousands of years now. Church all over the world, ordinary people, mix of talents, and abilities, insecurities, inadequacies. The Holy Spirit's been breathing on them, filling them with himself. And as that opening song we sang this morning, it's no longer I, but it's Christ who lives in me. The Holy Spirit lives his life through us and allows us to touch this world in a way that we can't do in our own strength. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. He does bring gifts. There are gifts of prophecy, discernment of spirits, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues, gifts of healing the miraculous. There are gifts. And he brings those to people. It's wonderful we see those in operation, but those are mainly, I believe, for the marketplace. Those are mainly for us engaging with the world. But one promise he has given is that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That means if you're timid, if you struggle to share, if you struggle to find focus, then the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to be a witness. And in a moment, I'm going to pray for you to receive that power of the Holy Spirit, His promise that was spoken about many years before it happened through the prophet Joel. Before I do that, I want to give anybody here this morning an opportunity who wants to give their life to Jesus. You've heard the songs, you've seen some of the testimonies, you've probably made some judgment calls about why people may be engaging in this in the way that they are. And you might have come to the conclusion, it feels like I'm missing something. It feels like these people are either nuts or they've got something I haven't. I believe Jesus loves you and his whole reason of coming to this earth was so that you might find him. You can't earn it. It's not like some sort of nectar card system where you can get enough righteousness to earn your way to God's love. You already have his complete attention and his complete love. But it has to be received. And the way we receive his love is, see, he's a, he's a God of righteousness. 
that means he's perfect and clean. And I don't know if you've ever had a nice white carpet fitted in your home. And it just looks beautiful and showroom-like. And then someone comes to your door wearing muddy boots. Got a couple of options. Send them away. That's what some people believe God does. But it's not what he does. God wants to change your footwear so you can walk on the carpet and approach him with confidence. He doesn't want you to be paranoid about your messiness. He wants you to be free. And he lays, actually not a white carpet, he lays a red carpet before you because you're sons and daughters of God when you give your life to him. And he's there, not sat in his austere throne looking distant. He stands and rises from his throne with his arms stretched wide. And he says, come here. I've been wanting to love you for forever. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you want to give your life to Jesus and approach him, receive his cleansing, his forgiveness, so you can approach him and receive his hug of love, then please pray this prayer quietly in your mind after me and God will hear your thoughts. And it goes like this. Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you gave your life in order that my mess can be dealt with. Please forgive me. Come and wash me on the inside from all of that shame, all those things that I'm embarrassed about, all that stuff I feel conscious about in my past. Please forgive me. And I receive your gift of forgiveness. And I step and approach you. And say, will you fill me with your love? I want to follow you. I want to spend the rest of my days knowing the hug of God on my life. Knowing your love. This is my destiny. And I'm looking forward to the adventure. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name.